Lord, that even all around this, this, uh, this campus this morning, Lord, just great things with our teens, our children, water baptisms, and here right now with your word. We thank you for such an exciting day and what you're doing. So be glorified, Jesus, in everything in your precious name. Amen, amen, amen. So listen, I want you, if you have your Bibles, now we will put the scriptures up on the screen, but I want you to go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And I'm going to be starting a series today. We're starting right now on the blessing that you are under. Um, very soon, just for myself, and I'm sure many of you are curious as well, I'm going to be purchasing that Ancestry DNA thing. You know, because, yeah, because I really, I really want to know uh, my dad is half German. So there's a whole side, a whole European side of the family that I have no idea you know, really about. I don't know where, you know, I really don't know much of my roots other than my grandmother. It basically stops there. And I'm just so curious just to see what's inside of me, you know. And I know that ultimately, listen, ultimately I come from God. Amen. I have his DNA just like you do. You have God's DNA. We're all God's creation. But I don't know about you, but there's something so curious about that. You know, at least for me it is. And I, I want to know. You know, if you look at, uh, uh, I, was, I just saw my family uh, this past week uh, on the East Coast, and we were in Florida celebrating my mom's birthday. I had a board meeting to go to, and so we were in Florida, and, um, you know, it, I laugh at the pictures, and because I am like a, almost a head taller, I'm definitely a, like a head and a, and a neck taller than my mom. My dad is short, you know, and, and both my brothers are shorter than me. So where did my height come from? Don't worry. Listen, I look like my dad, too, and my mom. Some of you thinking, oh, you know, no, we all look like we all look like mom and dad. So we're good. You know, listen, but but, you know, but it makes you think like, where did the where did the height part come from if everybody's short, you know? And so just things like that. I just think that it's so cool. But so today's sermon Listen, every single one of you, every one of you that you can hear me, whether you're listening to this through, through you know, YouTube or whether you're right here present with me, this message applies to you because there's a blessing that you're under that you need to understand and not forget. There's a blessing that you are under. Don't worry about that. that, that there's a truck that's going to probably be picking something up. That's what that noise is. Sorry about that. So listen, we're all God's creation, and we're going to be talking about uh, Abraham. Everyone say Abraham. Abraham. Okay. And, and I'm going to give you some titles of Abraham in a moment. But what I want to let you know is this, and this is simply remember that there was a time that God said that he looked on the earth and the earth was full of wickedness. He said that ev that the inclination of man's hearts was so evil that he basically, listen, started all over. And who did he start all over with? He started with Noah um, his wife, his sons, and their wives, okay? So God started all over with Noah. Now, remember, Noah is, of course, uh, you know, generations of from Adam and Eve, okay? Because Adam and Eve started everything, right? Okay. Listen, this is not a fairy tale. This is real stuff. I, I remember being in a college class, a linguistics class in college, and the the teacher was was an atheist. He didn't believe in God, but he said, he goes, listen, I'm not, I'm not supporting or adding to any religious people in this place, but what I want to let you know is that if you look at history and when you go to the Tower of Babel chapter um, after Noah and everything and the Tower of Babel where God confused the language of the people and all languages dispersed, he said what's really odd is that during that time when they look at history, they see a record of, of language just completely spreading out. Isn't that amazing? That someone who doesn't believe in God even verifies in some way the fact that the Bible talking about God creating different languages was around the same time that the Bible records it. Isn't that good? That's just, that's just so powerful. But anyway, so I don't want to get sidetracked, but Noah and his sons, his, his three sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, okay? So Shem was the oldest. Shem was the oldest, and so... What you need to know is, is many times the blessing, there's a blessing on the firstborn son. And that is the line that actually that God used to bring about Abraham through Shem. Generations and generations came Abraham. But listen, but Abraham was also 
in Abraham's line came Jesus. This is powerful. So when you go to, so for example, when you go to Matthew chapter 1 and you read the first two verses, when it starts the genealogy of Jesus, that means who were all Jesus' relatives, it starts out with Abraham. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. And it starts listing all the way through, listen, all the way through, because the Jews were meticulously at recording, and it lists all the way to, listen, the bloodline of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So here's the thing. Abraham, let me, let, who was Abraham? Why was he so important? First of all, um, for, for biblical scholars and Jewish people, he was the first Jew. He was the first Jew. Um, he is designated the birther of Judaism. Uh, he is known as Father Abraham. He's known as the father of faith. The lineage, I said this, but the lineage of Christ came through him. Um, he gave us the first Old Testament example or a type and shadow of Jesus, the Messiah. We're going we're gonna to be going over some of these powerful principles over these next three weeks. Abraham is the first great example of, of the relationship between a father, the, God the Father and his son Jesus and the plan of God that he had for all of us. So, but here, here is the thing. Now, the title of this message is The Blessing That You're Under. There is blessing that still filters down to you and to me. It, and, and it's not even about still. It does filter to you and to me. These blessings that God spoke over Abraham, which all of you are descended from. Listen to what I'm saying. You're all descended because we're all descended from the same person, God. Amen. Come on now. Your skin tone color and all of these things don't dictate anything in relation to who you are as a created person creature or created being in the image of God, you will all have God's DNA in you. Listen, you need, to, you need to dwell on that. Whenever you feel low or you feel down, you need to understand that the DNA of God is in you. The DNA of God is in you. That is important because there's some people that you just feel like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm second rated this or I'm this, that, and the other. Listen, no, you are God's creation. You need to know that you're his son or you're his daughter. This is so important. Listen, so what we see in, in Abraham with his, rela his relationship with Isaac, we see the same thing, the relationship with the father and Jesus, um, the, the birth of Christ, how, how Abraham's wife, we're going to get into this maybe, maybe next week, how uh, Sarah, his wife, she was barren. They couldn't have children. And, and supernaturally in their old age, she became pregnant, and that's where Isaac was born, and that's where the promise came through. Jesus came through all of that line. Um, and also there was a time when God tested Abraham, and, and he wanted to see, you know, would you really give me everything? And he asked him, would you give me even your own son, Isaac? And how many of you guys know that our Heavenly Father gave us his son as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind? Amen? Isn't that good news? That is such good news. So listen, what does this have to do with you? There is a blessing you are directly under because of what Abraham did. We have two goals today, two goals. Number one, understand the blessing slash DNA that you're under. And number two, discover the patterns of Abraham's life and why he was able to walk in the blessing so that you can walk in it as well. Come on now. I remember my real estate mentor. I've shared this with you guys before. He was 28 years old. I was 35 years old. He was seven years younger than me. This little whippersnapper and everything. And I'll never forget sitting at Cheesecake Factory. And I asked him, I said, Brian, I said, listen, I want to do what you do. How did you do it? Now, how many of you guys know that his age didn't mean anything to me? What mattered is his 50 properties that he owned free and clear. You hear what I'm saying? 28 years old. How did you do it? How did you get all those properties? How many of you guys know? I didn't care that he was 28, but I was paying attention. You hear what I'm saying? So that's important. So we want to understand how Abraham did it because we want to walk in that blessing as well. So let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Let's read about Abraham and let's see about his life. So verse 1 in chapter 12 says this. The Lord had said to Abram. Now, now I, I, I want to stop right here because why is it saying Abram? We're going to study this later on as well. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, and there's power in this. You're going to see this when we, do, when we walk through this. But listen, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, 
and your father's household to the land I will show you. Listen, listen to the blessing. Come on now, this is about you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. All peoples, listen, can, can, can you look at somebody and just say all? Just do that real quick. Look at somebody. You are in all. You are in all. All peoples on the earth will be blessed through you, Abram or Abraham. Come on, I need to say that one more time. All peoples on the earth will be blessed through you, meaning Abram. They will be blessed. You are blessed through him. And it's, listen, it's not just because Jesus came through that line of just salvation. It's other things as well. And this is what I want you to, to get in your spirit. Because God didn't save you to just get a free, get out of jail free card and, and just, you know, slip into eternity and just, oh, here I am. I received Jesus. No, God has called you to be a conqueror on this earth. God has a blessing that you are under. And if you would, if you would listen to and see how Abram did it, why did Abram walk in this blessing? There are signs. It's not that just he was chosen. There are signs on why God chose him. So let's go through this. So verse 4. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Verse 5 says, He took his wife Sarah, or Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Let's skip to verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring. Your seed, that's what that word means, your seed. I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Listen, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Now there was, now listen, verse 10. This is important. Now there was a famine in the land. Famine means lack. There was lack of food, lack of water, lack of provision. There was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Now I want to continue one more thing before I comment on this. Genesis chapter 13 now, I want to read verses 1 to 4. Everyone say there was a famine in the land. Come on, let me hear you one more time. There was a famine in the land. That means there was lack physically in every way. But what happened to Abram? Well, in verse 1 says, So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything that he had, and his nephew Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock, in silver, and gold. How did he become wealthy when there was a famine? The reason is because there was a blessing that was on his life. Listen, not only was there a blessing, but there were some things that he did that we already read that caused him to stand out, and you're going to see this. Listen, verse 3. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, listen, where his tent had been earlier and when, where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. So here's the thing. The first thing is what made Abram stand out? In chapter 12, when we read it, we read it. It says, the Lord told him, I want you to go to this land. He didn't know anything about the land. He didn't know if God was going to take care of him. He didn't know. All he know is God said, go. So what we find with Abram is this, or Abraham, is that he was obedient. He was obedient. It didn't matter what it looked like. It didn't matter what it looked like. Listen, he was obedient. 
And can I tell you that there is always a blessing on the other side of obedience. If God tells you to do something, listen, it's not just because he wants to control you or he wants you to go through a, a terrible life or anything. Listen, there is blessing for obedience. There's blessing for obedience. You need to know that. This man stepped out in obedience. Now, I don't have time to get into this, but in Hebrews chapter 11, later on in the New Testament, there's this chapter, chapter 11, and it's called the Hall of Faith. Now, what is that chapter about? It's about all these amazing people that stepped out in faith even when they didn't know what it looked like. There are two main people that that chapter talks about the most, Abraham and Moses. God honored Abraham because he stepped out in faith even when he didn't know what it looked like. Come on, church. This is powerful. Now, number two, which is the part that I'm most excited about, is this. You guys heard me say it a couple of times. When he went out to Canaan, listen, when he went out into the first set of land that he came to and Bethel and Ai, Bethel means house of God, when he went there, what is it? Come on, I need some help in this place. What did he do? What was the first thing he did? He built an altar. He built an altar. So when he went to a new place, he built an altar unto the Lord. Come on now. That is strong. What does that look like in our lives? What happens at an altar? Listen, sacrifice and exchange is what happens at an altar. That's what happens at an altar. That's why, listen, you know what? Maybe during the week this place is a school, but on Sunday, this place right here, it's an altar. And it is holy unto the Lord, and we treat it as holy unto the Lord. We treat it as holy unto the Lord because this is a special place. And sacrifice happens at an altar. That's where sacrifice happens. So anything that you erect that's an altar, the significance behind it is sacrifice. Everyone say sacrifice. Because that's what they did on the altar. They would place the sacrifices that they would worship. Come on unto God. That's why your praise and your worship is so important. When you praise and you worship, it is sacrifice unto the Lord. Can I tell you something? There's such a difference between the preaching of the word and praise and worship. Do you know why? There are two totally different things. One of them you receive, the other one you give. Come on now. You heard what I said? The word, we come and we just, we eat. You're listening to pastor right now. I'm giving you a word that I prayed about, fasted about, asked God about. But can I tell you this? But praise and worship is what you offer to him. And that's powerful. Amen? So that's what happens at an altar. The second thing that happens at an altar is worship. We just, we just spoke of this, which is a form of sacrifice, but worship happens at the altar. We come to the altar. We come to the house of God, and we give God worship, and we give God praise. Remember this. Listen, you're not going around taking rocks and wood and creating an altar everywhere you go, but here's the thing. New things in your life or things that happen in your life, I'm going to walk you through a couple of these things. You will see that there are altars that we are erecting unto the Lord, and the Lord will remember what you do for him. Come on now. Listen to what I'm saying. The Lord will remember what you do for him. The Lord will remember what you do. The third thing, what happens at an altar? Man, one of the most powerful, and, and in my opinion, the second most powerful covenant or agreement that is made, and that is between a man and a woman. When they come to the altar and they give the, listen, listen, marriage is not just like, oh, let's, ha let's have a wedding, be together forever, and have a party, and get gifts, and all this. Listen, when you come to the altar in marriage, you die. And some of you are like, yeah, amen, I know. No, it's good. <laughs> listen, you die. 
Ephesians talks about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, cleansing her by the washing of the water of the word. Let me tell you something. Marriage is sacrifice. Marriage is dying to yourself. Girls, that man that you're waiting for, listen, can I tell you something? Wait for the right one. Listen, don't test, don't test it out and say, yeah, let's see what happens with this. Don't go through that heartache. And listen, and, and if you have been already through that, listen, you, on your second round, listen, pray about it. Ask God about it. Let God give you direction because marriage is sacrifice. Wives, what you have to deal with, with men and their mess and their stuff is a lot. It's sacrifice. That's what happens at an altar. You come to the altar. Listen, my pastor looked at me and he said, are you sure? No, he wasn't. He, he was. Listen, can I tell you something? I wish I had a picture. He was not playing. He said, Erwin, he goes, are you sure? He said, because this is a one time thing right now. And you need to let me know. I'll tell He said, I'll tell everybody. But you need to know that you're going to give your life for Joanne. And I was like, man, I'm thinking about like, you know, I, yeah, I was thinking about the ceremony, but I'm also thinking, man, is the limo guy going to show up on time? And, you know, all these things we had put money. Listen, can I say this to you? He was serious. He said, until you get to that altar, this is what he said, until you get to that altar, he goes, you can turn around. But once you get to that altar, that's it. That's it. No turning back. And just once again, let me just say this to you, man, if it if, if, if life happened and maybe the person you were with made certain decisions or or whatever and it didn't work out. Hey, listen, listen, we're not here to condemn you, bash you or nothing. All I'm just saying to you is, listen, just I'm encouraging you do it God's way. Do it God's way, because marriage is work. And the answer is, well, we're just not going to get married and we're going to shack up. That's not the answer. Come on now. I know, I know we're probably not happy about what I just said, but that's okay. I'm preaching God's word. You can talk with God. Because I'm not going to back away from what I know the scripture says. The altar is holy. So what happens at the altar? Covenant takes place. When I stood with Joanne, we made covenant at the altar. I said, you are my wife, and she said, I am your husband. Come on now. That's good stuff, man. I'll just pat myself. It was real good. Listen, what's powerful about the altar, too? There are many of you in this place that you can remember that there was a time that at the altar, you said yes to God. You said yes. Listen, I said yes in my bedroom to receiving Jesus Christ into my heart. But it was when the first time my youth pastor asked me to speak an encouraging word to the youth that I was walking down the stairs after seeing 198 people come to the altar, weeping and crying. And I was coming down the stairs and the Lord said, this is what you'll do for the rest of your life. I said, yes, yes to you could be totally different things. It could be yes. Listen, listen, don't ever negate some things that people call simple. Moms, the work that you do to be a mother is the greatest ministry that you will ever, ever have. Come on now. Listen, that ministry that you do with raising your children is so powerful. They say what a woman does in taking care of, of a child is greater than, the, than an eight-hour work uh, day for a, for a regular man or a woman that they go do things. Listen, there are women, you're holding it down with a job and you're taking care of children. I can't, I don't even know. Some, I mean, Tasia, Tasia's funny to me. I don't know how she does it. I'm like, I just get tired in my mind thinking about her, no sleep, four girls, you know, Lewis. And is, Lewis don't sleep sometimes. He tells me, and I'm like, I don't know how you do Oh, there he is. Lewis is back there. I don't, I don't know how, you, I don't know how they do it. But they did. <laughs> Pastor Naomi raised her girls. How many girls? Four girls. 
basically by herself. By herself, working multiple jobs, just trying to hold it down for her children. What a blessing. What a blessing. And can I say something to the men? In, this is a freebie. It's not in my notes. But I want to say this to the men. Men, please be men. Step up and do what the Bible says. Step up and take care of your wife and take care of your children. Come on, man. We got, we got to step up into who God made us to be. Amen? We have to do that. It's right because this altar is a holy place. And can I tell you something? Going back, the blessing that Abraham walked under, he was walking under because he knew how to build an altar unto the Lord. Come on now. There are people in this place. That pool out there, will, to some of the people today, will be an altar. I'm believing for all of them, and I'm asking they have an encounter with God. Because when they go down and they come up, I'm praying, God, do something supernatural in their life. That will be an altar unto the Lord. Listen, the altar is a place of his presence. At the altar, I remember moments of crying and being on my knees. And I said, God, I give you everything. I surrender my life. Those are times of altar that I'm building an altar unto the Lord. I remember you, Erwin, when you said that to me. I remember when you said that you'll give me everything. God remembers. God remembers what you say. Do you know that I had first told God, I don't want to be in the ministry? I'm going to be a businessman. Isn't that funny? I told God. I, someone, to, a friend of mine who was a praise and worship leader told me, he says, you have a calling to be a pastor. And I said, yeah, put, that, put a comma on that. And I walked in my bedroom and I closed the door and I said, God, I will never be a pastor. Well, that's funny, right? Okay. I said, no, I'm going to be a businessman. And you know what? God had patience with me because my destiny was to preach the gospel. And can I tell you something that many of you had had moments at the altar where God touched you? You know, I was talking with LaDonna uh, four or five months ago, and I just was uh, asking her a question about, like, because I saw, uh, I just saw a shift in her life take place. And... Um, I was so curious about it because I just saw, like, as her pastor, I just saw a genuine change in her life, uh, just drawing closer to God. And so I just quizzed her, and I said, hey, I said, I just got to ask you what happened to you because I felt like, you know, I knew she always loved the Lord. She always had, to me, she always had integrity, character, all of these things. But I noticed, and I said, I noticed something, and she what happened? And she told me a guest speaker that we had come in was preaching and said some things, and that was an altar moment for her. And I was like, I never would have guessed that. Because I thought it would have been that it would have happened when I said something. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's so funny. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. Listen, I want, I want to show you some, some, some of our family know this. I, I just want to tell you about the last altar, and I just want to show it to you real quick. You, you guys have no idea, like, what this means to me. I just want to explain it to you because it's powerful. But this is just a, a Seiko watch, and uh, it just it speaks so much to me, and I'm going to tell you why. Because um, when I was a youth pastor, um, my pastor, he had a really nice watch, and I loved watches. I always loved watches, and you know, and up to that point, I was buying the generic kind, you know, trying to fake it till you make it, you know, type thing. I just, I just liked watches, and I was just buying all the cheap knockoffs and everything. And finally, I just, you know, I was a youth pastor. I wasn't making a lot of money. Joanne was making five dollars uh, a month, uh, five dollars an hour. I'm sorry, at uh, working for the church too. So you know, and just, and and so. What I did was I did a layaway. Remember when layaway, maybe they brought it back. But it was actually at Zales. Um, this watch was $400 way back in the uh, early 90s. And what I did was I made payments, uh, you know, for I think it was for about 11 months. And I couldn't wait to get my watch. And I was so proud of my watch. And I got this watch. 
And, uh, man, I just started to wear it. And I, I think I had it maybe for about two weeks. And so what happened was is, the, is my pastor on a Wednesday night was preaching. And as he was preaching, um, a lady in the, in, in, I don't know if she was in the second row or the front row, but she got up and she had a check in her hand. And she went to the altar while he was preaching, and she put a check on the altar. So we were all looking at her and just saying, what in the world is she doing? And he's preaching. He, you could tell he doesn't know what she's doing because, you know, he felt, I think he got even a little annoyed that he was interrupted. And so all of a sudden, somebody else comes up, and they put $20 on the altar. And the whole church started coming as the pastors, my pastors trying to preach, and just no, no, no movement, no nothing, began coming up and putting money on the altar. I saw people taking their jewelry off, all this stuff, and just putting it on the altar. It was something crazy. And we're just sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, you know, and part of me was happy that I didn't have any money in my pocket, you know. And I just was like, you know, because I would have had to put it all because people were just putting everything they had. People were walking out of the church, going to their cars, and getting money and putting it on the altar. And I just was like, man, this is crazy. So I'm sitting there watching this. People just, because it was a big church, coming, 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 putting stuff over there. And the Lord speaks to me as I'm bowing my head, and he says, put your watch in. And I said, I said, man, that's got to be the devil. You know, I said, that's, that's not God. There's no way that's God. There's no way God would, like, I saved up 11, 11 months, um, you know, paid it off and, and everything, and, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, no, God, no, no, for real, no, I mean, this is... And I kn- listen, I don't know a lot, but I know his voice, and I knew it was him. And he's just like, and, and so I sit there, and I'm just like, oh, man. And, and it started winding down, and I was hoping that he would just close it up in time and all this stuff. And, and um, I took my watch off, man, and I just, I just, I literally just walked over. And I'm not going to tell you that I was just like happy and just like, yeah, hallelujah, glory to God. You know, I was just like here, you know, and just, just. <laughs> I just walked back to my seat, like almost like the walk of shame, and, and I sat there, and I was just like, man, you know, and, and so, and I kid you not, about 10 seconds later, he stopped it, and I'm so glad I, I, I got in the window, so, man, there goes my watch, and so, you know, all of this and stuff, so that Sunday, uh, that, I'm sorry, that was a Wednesday, and on Thursday morning, I get a phone call, and it's this guy, Chris. And Chris says, uh, Pastor Irwin, he says, I want to meet you. Um, and I said, hey, you know, Chris, I just, I, I got to do some things. And he goes, listen, it'll be quick. And I just was like, man, I just didn't need, I didn't have time for a counseling. And I go over there, and um, he's, I said, hey, what's going on, Chris? I, we, we met at a supermarket. And, uh, and I said, what's going on, Chris? And he said, you know, the Lord told me to give you something. And he pulls out of his pocket 10 $100 bills, brand new, crispy. And he puts them in my hand. He says, I just wanted to be obedient to what the Lord told me to do. Here's, this is not, that's not the best part. The best part is two, day, two days, at, no, the following Tuesday, someone went and they got me and gave me the exact same watch that I put on the altar. So had I not obeyed, And had I not built an altar of trust where I said, God, I trust you. So forever, to me, like this watch that is not nearly as nice as any watch that, you know, that that I have and stuff. But to me, what it represents is I just remember that that one time that I obeyed God. And you know what God was saying? Are you willing to give me everything? And you know what? I guess that test I passed. And I have just seen God over and over with my wife. When we obeyed God, he would always provide. He would always provide. So I want to tell you this, that I want to encourage you that you would build altars unto the Lord. Because that time in 1996 till right now, this is still speaking for me. 
this is. See, the thing about an altar, when they would erect an altar, it was a sign that God was there. They would build that altar to remind them of what God did and what he said. So every time, like I'm not, I wasn't fake crying. I just get emotional because I know how I felt when God said, would you give me your watch? And I didn't want to, but I said yes. And I believe that there's people in this place that, that if you would allow God to knock on your heart or that last thing that he told you to do, if you would complete it, I want to let you know that on the other side of that, there's a blessing. There's a blessing. I don't know if you're going to get a phone call and someone's going to tell you to meet him at a supermarket and give you $1,000. I'm not telling you that, but I'll tell you this. I pray that on the other side of your obedience, you get way more than I did. Because this is still talking to me. And it's still talking to him. Still. This thing right here. There's only one of two things that are going to happen with this watch. A, I'm going to die with it. Or B, it's going in my dad's coffin. One of the two. He's the greatest man I ever met. And still no. So that's the only thing that's going to happen to this. Because it is a sign of a covenant that I have with my heavenly father. That I've seen him come through when I just would obey. Build an altar unto the Lord. Listen, and I want to tell you one more thing. Genesis chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, and I'll end with this. Jamil, if you can come help me. It says, from the Negev, he went from place to place, listen, until he came to Bethel. Remember, Bethel means house of God. To the place between Bethel and Ai, listen, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. And can I tell you something? Every time you build an altar, you can call on the name of the Lord. Every time you have a breakthrough of obedience, there is an anointing and there is power on that subject with you that you can say, I have the victory. I remember when I made the decision, this is an altar. I said, I will not be with any other woman until God, you send my wife. That was an altar and it was tough. But I said, yes, it was an altar unto God. And he remembered it. The reason why that's so powerful that what we just read is that after that, his nephew named Lot he began to prosper too. And they had so much cattle and so many things. And actually the herdsmen that were taking care of their cattle started fighting and arguing with one another. And, and so basically, I'm going to tell you my version. It's like one of us got to go. And so Abraham and Lot got together and he asked Lot, which way do you want to go? And he looked at both sides, but he looked at the side that had the really green grass and flowing rivers and water. And he said, I'll go that way. He goes, you, you can go that way. See, when you build an altar unto the Lord and you call upon the name of the Lord, something may look good, but it may be horrible. It may be terrible. That person that... It's so awesome. That seems to be so great. That business deal that you're about to go through. But something inside of you says, first, let me go to the altar. Say, God, what do you say? What do you know about them that I don't know? What do you know about this situation that I don't know? And can I say this to you? That, that direction that Lot went ended up being disaster for him. But Abram prospered. Actually, Abram rescued Lot out of a horrible situation. Why? Because Abram went back to the altar that he had erected for God. And in that place that he said, God, you are here. He said, what do I do? Where are you, God? And can I tell you something? That in the hardest times, and, I, and this is just such an easy example to use, but in the hardest times where I'm just like, God, what do I do? Listen, I've lost everything. But I remember the day 
that God said, will you build an altar for me? And I remembered, you know what, God, I may lose everything, and I did, but I'll get it back. Because I know the God whom I serve. Don't forget your altars that you've built for God. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. Father, we love you, and God, we just preach your word, and we thank you, Lord, that there's such an anointing on this word, Father, as we study the life of Abraham and the, the blessing that we are under. So I just ask you to encourage people this morning to let them know that God is a big God. You're a big God and that you care about everything in their life. So, Father, some of us may be walking through destruction, but, Lord God, I thank you that on the other side of that destruction, on the other side of that thing falling apart, I thank you that you are still there. You're here right now as it's falling apart, and you will be there for me after it's all over. But, God, I ask you that people would be reminded at the things that God has done, the altars that they have built, the prayers the gifts they've given unto you, Lord, the things they've said at this altar where they felt your Holy Spirit presence. Minister in the name of Jesus. Encourage people today, Father, that they would say, God, I want to be obedient to you, God, because you are God. And that, Lord, they would, we would all learn to build altars unto the Lord, saying, Lord, I give this to you. It belongs to you. I'm just a manager over everything that I have. I'm a manager over my wife. I'm a manager over my company. I'm a manager over my business. I'm a manager over my job. I'm a manager over my lawn. I'm a manager over my car. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. Help me to be a better manager. We thank you, Lord, that we lay altars. And as you're bowing your head and closing your eyes this moment, the greatest altar that you can erect is when you say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I surrender to you, God. I've been, I've been running and I've just been doing things my own way. But, but Lord, I want to serve you. Jesus, I, I want to know you. And I want to tell you, my friend, as you're sitting here, that God loves you so much. It's not an accident that you're here. But this morning, God is calling you and he's saying, I want you to know me like Abraham knew me. I want you to know me, that I'm a good, good father. So here under the sound of my voice as you're sitting there and thinking, let the Holy Spirit tap on your heart and obey God's prompting. If you're here this morning, you would say, Pastor, I need prayer. I, I, I need to surrender it all to God. And I know that I haven't. I've messed up. But I know that because of Jesus and what he did, I can get it right today. I need God to forgive me. I want Jesus in my life completely.